Playing to win a match of Fortnite is pretty simple. You land somewhere, loot, try to survive to the end whilst maybe hitting a couple triple edit one pumps along the way, and eventually win the final 1v1 to claim a victory royale. But what if the lobby just doesn't fight. Well, that actually happened a lot in 2018, the first year of Fortnite tournaments. Matches in the $10 million fall skirmish often had over 60 players left alive after around 20 minutes of gameplay, which caused some pretty severe server performance issues. Super competitive, man. There has to be some, they have to do something. In these early days of competitive Fortnite, severe performance issues were very common. It seemed like Fortnite wasn't optimized for this many actions to happen all at once. Now, if only one player is alive, every action they carry out is sent to the server and then sent back and in a very oversimplified way. So say every build placed is one action. For every player alive, that action has to be sent back to their screens so that all players in the lobby see that single build being placed at the same time. But you also have to remember, each player alive isn't just standing there watching TikTok whilst everyone else plays the game. They're placing builds, editing, and shooting themselves. So the more players alive, the more actions are being sent to the servers, and the more times the server has to replicate all of these actions to other players' screens. Now, a lot of these issues are cancelled out by render distance, where if a player is more than 290 meters away, all of those actions won't be replicated on your screen. This ensures that early game, where all 100 players are alive, isn't a complete laggy mess as most players are evenly spread out across the map, ensuring you only have a few players in your render distance. But if a large number of players decide just not to fight, then eventually they'll all be forced into a small area, causing a ton of stress on the servers. Now, that's only problem one. You see this right here? That's what we call boring as fuck gameplay. And here's the thing, even in 2018, Epic Games knew this. The problem was pretty simple. People weren't fighting, but the solutions to try and fix this are incredibly complicated. Now you may think, if you want people to fight, you should make elimination points worth a lot. However, the issue here is this devalues winning the game, which is something Epic Games prioritizes highly. The whole point of a battle royale is to survive the longest and win the game, so making this not as important by making eliminations worth more often just leads to kind of boring matches where yes, you get to see a lot of fighting and aggression, but there's no interesting endgame and there's not a lot of strategy. So let's take a look at the $1.5 million summer skirmish as an example that was also held in 2018. Here the finals in week 8 were solos and in order to get any points for placement you'd need to get into the top 10. And then to get a second placement point you need to play second or third and then finally you need to get an additional point for winning the game. So three placement points total. You could also get points for elims but you needed to get three in order to get a single point. Then once you got five elims you'd get a second point and then if you got seven or more elims you would just get three points. But this meant that if you placed 11th with two elims, which is a very respectable match, you got zero points. Now, in a tournament like this, it's easier for the majority of players to get into a top 10 than it is to get three elims. So in the summer skirmish, for example, it makes a lot of sense that everyone played very passively. In this, this restrictive format led to players tying in points a lot to the point that one qualifier slot to the finals was actually decided by a literal coin flip. We've got a decision. Because their points, victory royales, elims, and average placement were all exactly the same. RIP to Colton FN who missed out to a qualification slot to the finals because of literal RNG. Now, Epic Games knew that passive Play was very boring and even attempted to make the matches more interesting by adding bonuses for players who dropped high elimination games. For example, in week two of the summer skirmish, they added a $10,000 bonus for anyone who dropped a 20 elim win, which, you know, kind of unrealistic. And then they even went as far away as giving $50,000 to the team with the most elims in a match in week number four. They attempted a lot of different things, but all of these points that I've just said are easily summarized as people play for placement and that is boring to watch. So too many players creates a ton of lag and there's too many players because everyone is playing passive, but they can't play too aggressively because then playing to survive won't be important, which is the entire point of a battle royale. So this problem is very complex and actually requires a very complex solution. Storm Surge. A Storm Surge allows the number of players alive in a game to be controlled by, at certain points in the game, damaging the players who have dealt the least amount of damage themselves. No longer can you sit and do nothing in your box as you'll start to take damage at certain points in the game if there's too many players alive, and you will die to Storm Surge. This mechanic is actually in every playlist, including public matches. It's just extremely rare. I asked my good friends at Assyrian GG to see if they could find any games out of the 40,000 or so they had on their database, and in pubs and ranked, zero of these had Storm Surge. Now, that 
doesn't mean it doesn't happen. There's a lot more games than this, but it's extremely rare. You almost never see it because, of course, players just don't play this passively outside of tournaments, so the player numbers are just never high enough. Now, Surge has changed a ton over the years, but its current day format is probably the easiest to get into. Let's start with the first time it's active, which is the second zone. If there are more than 90 players alive when the second zone appears, then the players who have dealt the least damage will be tagged for 25 damage every 5 seconds, and Surge will only stop once there's 90 players alive. So, if there's 91 players alive and you have done the least damage, you will be the one taking damage from Surge. You can only stop the Storm Surge damage by dealing damage to other players, which will put you above the threshold of the shown on the right side of your screen. One Storm Circle before, there will also be a warning that pops up just to let you know that it's going to happen when the storm closes. So, how much damage is enough? Well, a lot of people, and a lot of badly researched articles, think that there's a set number of damage you need to deal per zone, but in reality, it is a leaderboard. So, in our 91 player live match, let's say our bottom damaging player, Ozzy Antics, has only dealt 25 damage because he's missed every bullet outside of one. Now, our 90th player on the leaderboard, uh, Boop, has only dealt 26 damage for the same reason, but he had a little better weapon and it dealt one more damage. Now, when the second zone appears, Ozzy will start to take storm surge damage because he's below the 90 player threshold. However, as soon as he eventually hits a shot, finally, and deals more damage than Boop, he'll overtake him and be above the threshold. Meaning now Boop is below and needs to deal damage, but of course he's not going to hit a shot because he'll miss everything also. This will continue until there's only 90 players alive, and then this will repeat in the third storm circle with a different player threshold. Of course, I'm second all the way up at the top of the leaderboard because I've been frying these shitters, but of course this imaginary match is in a tournament, so I'm losing on damage to a hacker. So the thresholds and saying damage a hundred times is quite difficult to remember, but it is actually quite a good system to ensure that the passive players actually deal out damage and don't just do nothing for the entire game. But of course, it wouldn't be a Fortnite mechanic without some bugs and cheeses. In multiple Fortnite seasons, what was actually counted as damage has been very, very questionable. In Chapter 2 Season 3, damage to Marauders, a group of roaming NPCs, actually counted towards the total damage you've dealt. This means that there were some teams who could deal an insane amount of damage and completely bypass Storm Surge altogether. Now, some players were stupid enough to leak the strategy into Pro Scrims, meaning it never made it into FNCS, but this kind of similar thing kept reoccurring as in Chapter 2 Season 5, the NPC The Mandalorian also counted as damage towards Storm Surge. Now, some players like Kree, who were attempting to qualify for the FNCS Grand Finals by playing Heal Off in the Storm only used an insane amount of heals in the storm to out heal the damage. Now for any normal team, you could out heal storm surge in some situations. However, this would leave you with nothing in your inventory to play out the rest of the game. So it's just not worth doing. And this only worked for Kree and the heal off players because they had abundance of heals around them and literally nothing else. The strategy was of course so game breaking that the storm sickness mechanic needed to be added to the game to counteract it. But the most controversial part of storm surge is of course trading. And back in chapter two, NA players Bucky, Creo, Lacks and Keys were banned for 60 days for doing it. Now they dropped at Slurpee Swamps and each game repeatedly damaged each other, ensuring not to fully eliminate or knock the other team before using the heals in the drop spot around them to replenish their lost HP. They gained Storm Surge damage without losing anything and both teams kind of benefited from this. Now the difficulty here comes in assessing if this is a pre-agreed teaming where you've both agreed to do this or if it's just smart and they've actually scrimmed and played against each other a lot. This also happens a ton in other Fortnite tournaments, with Slurp Lance being a major problem in Chapter 4 as they healed you infinitely, so two opposing players could just tag each other, heal with these plants, and repeat. Even in Tayson and Mersnash did this with Trulex and Chicho at the FNCS Global Championships in their drop spot. In this situation, neither teams benefit from pushing the other, and despite the odd looks, it actually does look like a legitimate strategy, not teaming, but there's no way to tell if these players agreed to do this ahead of time, or if it's just a smart play to allow both teams to increase their damage. Of course, this is what makes trading Storm Surge so so controversial. And honestly, the most ironic part of Storm Surge is that the goal is to reduce player counts to prevent lag and promote aggression. But if the server is already lagging while players are trying to deal damage, then these shots often just blank and don't register, or the players will be teleporting all about, which obviously makes it incredibly difficult to rack up the damage, making it a little bit RNG. It seems like in Chapter 5, this has been made even worse, as a frozen player on your screen will still take damage if you shoot them, resulting in some insanely broken endgame clips. Now, racking up Storm Surge damage is incredibly difficult and requires a very deep understanding of how zone pools and where players are likely to position because of this. And if you want to learn more about how pro players strategize and plan for Storm Surge, you can click the video on screen right now.